Now we'll finish this. Uh, speaking about philosophy and art and philosophy and religion. Philosophy versus art. There are philosophers who think that philosophy is a form of art. This is the view of G. H. Gill. As he writes, philosophy is not like a lens through which we penetrate and scrutinize reality, not like a lamp, but which we explore previously undiscovered dimensions and all horizons of human existence, but like a prism with which fascinating and provocative conceptual patterns and those sculptures are created. A beautiful sense, but I think completely wrong. The aesthetic dimension. One reason was already exposed as we considered the relationship between philosophy and science. Philosophy has a heuristic proto-scientific goal. It aims to achieve truth even if only speculatively. Art, on the other hand, relates to truth only indirectly, insofar as it might educate our feelings. This is from Susan Langer and expressively suggests cognitive possibilities, showing what we conceal to ourselves. This is from Collingwood. A particular difficulty we find in the attempt to compare philosophy with art is that we do not even know for sure what art is, considering the many existent forms of art. There are, however, clear external properties of a philosophical writing that can be artistic, for instance, the resource of aphorisms. This can be found in Heraclitus, in Nietzsche and in Wittgenstein. The resource of myths in Plato, his allegories, his literary di dialogues, have all clear artistic value. The resource of rhetoric in philosophers after Kant, mainly in a philosopher like Heidegger, and in the later French philosophy, are well known. A characteristic that philosophy shares with art is the deployment of intensified metaphors in a wide sense of the term expressing feelings. This seems a general property of art. For instance, a painting, a poetry, a story can be interpreted in a multiplicity of ways and express refined feelings. According to Freud, what I call metaphor results from mechanisms of primary process. They are condensation and replacement. A metaphorical use of terms is almost unavoidable in philosophy. See, for example, uh, the Naufrage of Medusa from Jericho. Uh, this is the, the Medusa is there, 30 days, um, people are dying and uh, they see, in the end, a ship. Uh, this is, here is the ship. And um, this is the salvation for nine people. Uh, it seemed, I, I think that a uh, hundred died in, in this story. Uh, this is a metaphor for hope and uh, something that could be better explain it about the human nature, the human condition. Uh, moreover, philosophy has no aim external with itself. Like art, philosophy gives us an uninterested pleasure. Like art, philosophy can be a work of imagination. And like art, 
philosophy can have something like a cathartic function. Finally, like art, it seems to have an integrative function, not of our emotional lives, but of our rational lives, as a kind of art of reason. Well, relationships between philosophy and religion. Traditional features of philosophy as a search of wisdom and the sense of wonder, the appeal to transcendent principles of explanation and the drive towards a comprehensive understanding aiming to integrate our experiences by means of worldviews, along with the creation of philosophical systems enabling us to explain the world and the place of man in it, all these traits and aspects can hardly be understood if we continue to think of philosophy only as a cognitive enterprise anticipation in science. And all this has to have to do with religion. From this we can in conclude that philosophy has, in its history, shared with religion a. the goal of transcendence, b. the goal of comprehensiveness. a. religion, with its appeal to a god or a hierarchy of gods, achieves comprehensiveness, since the God of religion must explain all earthly phenomena. Moreover, it is by definition transcendent. 2. Philosophical systems shared these two features. They appealed to transcendence. Example, Plato's world of ideas, the nomenical world in Kant, and they developed as a way to explain our world in a comprehensive way, for instance, Leibniz's monadology, Hegel's dialectic system. This ideal of comprehensiveness is sustained by the analytical philosophy by Wittgenstein in the philosophical investigation. So he writes, the main source of our failure is that we do not command a clear view of our uses of words. Our grammar is lacking in this sort of perspicuity. A perspicuous, comprehensive representation, he calls übersichtliche Darstellung, produces just that understanding which consists in same connections same connections between uh, concepts that are central of our understanding of the world. Hence, the importance of saying and investigating intermediate cases. The concept of comprehensive representation is of fundamental significance for us. It marks the form of the account we give the way we look at things, and uh, he asks if this is a Wilton Welton Shaw. It seems that the role of the transcendental is replaced in philosophy by things like Bain, Parmenides, Idea in Plato, Uno in Plotinus, the nomenical world with the thing in itself and the transcendental I in Kant, the absolute in Hegel, the unspeakable in Wittgenstein. They have forms like those of physical transcendence, hypermentality, hyperphysicality, and body idiosyncrasy, mind-body idiosyncrasy. Even if this is not possible, it can be maintained as an ideal to be researched. Different from located conjectural knowledge, Philosophy must search for comprehensiveness as much as it is realistically possible. This ideal was suggested in the analytical philosophy by Wilfred Sillers. Zo Sillers, 
The aim of philosophy, abstractly formulated, is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. The conclusion. If the considerations made until now I write seem to be that, at least, philosophy shares with science its heuristic, truth-searching goal. It shares with art its metaphorical dimension, and it shares with religion tendencies to transcendentalism and to the broadness of its aims. Some consequences. There are also consequences. There is a direction to the scientific angle of the triangle, since the time more and more parts with the time more and more parts of philosophy are given up to science. Moreover, today philosophy ramifies itself into different domains and subdomains, which seems to be already expected seen of maturity. For example, epistemology is a domain of philosophy, but analysis of knowledge is a subdomain, theories of justification another, social epistemology another, theories of justification another, evidentialism and reliabilism are different and similarly incompatible theories of justification. There are two reactions to these, one is optimist, the other pessimist. Scott Solmes is very optimist. According to him, we are living in a, the era of specialization. Here, subdivision leads to new subdivision indefinitely, and there is an explosion of original philosophical work today. Others, like Susan Hack, are very pessimist. According to Hack, what is going on now is a disastrous fragmentation by means of hyper-specialization. It is what we call, what she calls, precocious specialization. This specialization goes on without solid basis, grounded upon dubious philosophical principles. This is different from scientific specialization, which is grounded upon already warranted principles. The result is war consent. People develop such ideas until boredom sets on. Then they begin constructing upon another dubious principle without having solved the early problems. This way of work is the result of scientism, she thinks, that is, the philosophical imitation of science, and their results are worthless. Wittgenstein also think has thought in this way. According to Hack, the way to reach integration is assured by means of the principle of conciliance, namely the idea that we live in only one world, and one unified world, and that therefore the related ideas of science and supposedly also of philosophy when these ideas are true, are able to reinforce one another. A main example of consilience is found in the genetic. Evolutionary theory complements itself with Mendelian genetics, which complements itself with molecular, molecular genetics. This is the kind of integration called by Susan Hack. What is needed is a work of integration that remembers what Wittgenstein called panoramic presentation, Übersichtliche Darstellung. Who is right, Scott Soames or Susan Hack? Personally, I think that there is insight and exaggeration on both sides. Specialization is important and often required, but Susan Hack is right when she says that there is a lack of what we called panoramic representations in the present philosophy. That is, it seems that there are too many people looking at the trees and almost none trying to look at the forest. And this Italian version of this text was present at the University of Macerata 
in 2022, and is based on my book, The Philosophical Inquiry. I thank you to Professor Francesco Oridio, who has invited me.